Hi, my name is Paris Wolf, and today we're going to be working on our cryptography questions 51 through 60 on the pre-assessment. So why is Diffie-Hellman used to distribute symmetric keys? Well, Diffie-Hellman is used to securely distribute the keys using asymmetric encryption to be able to go ahead and set up the symmetric encryption. Asymmetric encryptions are the key size are required to be a lot longer to be able to produce the same level of encryption as a symmetric encryption. And the asymmetric encryption takes a lot more uh, compute power. And so with Diffie-Hellman key exchange, they want to go ahead and as quickly as possible switch from asymmetric to symmetric encryption. You can't just pass the keys over with symmetric encryption because it's, it's not safe. So you need to distribute those keys with the asymmetric encryption, which is Diffie-Hellman. Uh, the other option here, it uses the same key to encrypt and decrypt large amounts of media. That's talking about asymmetric encryption. One bit at a time, that's talking about a stream cipher. So again, the answer, here we are. Question 52. Diffie-Hellman is vulnerable to what type of attacks? Well, because it's passing over the internet or over the network, it's going to be vulnerable to a man-in-the-middle attack. And the man-in-the-middle attack is when they're intercepting the data as it's being transferred, and they're changing and modifying that data. And usually they pretend to be one party or the other, or both. Well, the brute force attack, that is trying all different possible combinations of attacks. And a dictionary attack, that's a type of brute force attack where they go through a list of common words, such as a dictionary. A rainbow table, that's referring to a rainbow table uh, attack, which is they're comparing a pre-computed list of hashes to uh, a stolen database of, ha of hashed passwords. And again, the answer to what Diffie-Hellman is vulnerable to, that would be a man-in-the-middle attack. Which mechanism mitigates a copy and paste attack? So right off the bat, I want to go ahead and eliminate the message digest and the secure hashing algorithm because those are hashing algorithms used for integrity purposes. And so we know it has to either be ECB or OFB. So we're going to take a look at the two different uh, mechanisms and how that works and what exactly a copy and paste attack is. So with a copy and paste attack, they are receiving the data or the cipher and slowly that they're trying to decipher that data and with the electronic code book um, if the same data is here as it is in block two and they're using the same encryption they're going to they're going to be able to reveal what that encryption algorithm is by constantly resending and receiving those encrypted messages and decrypting it that way now the thing with the Output feedback is it introduces the initialization vector. So even if you had the same input over here as you had over here, the outputs are going to be completely different in these ciphers because of the initialization vector. So the output feedback mode um, mitigates the copy and paste attack because it's using this initialization vector and all the randomness that it's creating between each data. Question 54. Which one of these are so associated with forward secrecy? Okay, so immediately we want to eliminate the options that are not possible. And so because we see MD, we know that stands for message digest. And then we see the HA here. So you want to think hashing algorithm. And so we know those are definitely not the answers here. Now this is elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, which is Diffie-Hellman is for key exchange. And this is elliptic curve digital sig signature algorithm. So the answer is elliptic curve digital signature, or, or elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. And uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the Diffie-Hellmans. So forward secrecy is referring to either perfect forward secrecy, and it means they're using ephemeral or a new key is generated with each new connection or session. So they're saying that the previous sessions will not be compromised if they were able to um, get the key of a current session. And, and so what that means is that if my device is connected to your device and we have a session and um, during that during that session that we do have the uh, like symmetric encryption set up um, and originally we transferred those keys with the, the Diffie Hellman, so asymmetric originally, if that session was compromised, um, if we had 30 days of past history, they're not going to be able to break it into the last 29 days. They only have the data from that one session. 
And so that's the the benefit of having ephemeral keys is that a new key generated with each new connection or session. And these are the two different types of uh, Divi Hellman's that use the um, ephemeral keys or perfect forward secrecy. Question 55, which encryption component defines if a compromise of a long-term key prevents the compromise of any previous sessions? Well, we just um, looked at that and that would be called the forward secrecy or the perfect forward secrecy. Um, the other options here, the integrity check, that's referring to like checksums on a message or cryptographic hashes to see if the data has changed. This client hello and this server hello, um, that's talking about the TLS connections. And so when it's trying to set up um, the transport layer security, the device sends out a client hello, and then the server side sends out a server hello. I do want to um, go ahead and clarify that is different than the TCP connection where it's sending the SIN, acknowledge, SIN, acknowledge. Um, and this is specifically for security purposes of the TLS connection. And so the answer is forward secrecy. Question 56, what can Zor as pseudo random number to create, create a unique cipher? Uh, and that would be the initialization vector. And so when we're looking at that, they're Zoring the initialization vector. And we're gonna take a look at the image here with the uh, encryption algorithm and the data. And this is essentially, um, pretend this is the data and then they're, they're zoring it here with the initialization vector, the second line here, and this is a pseudo random number creating a unique cipher. We know it's not a hash, definitely know it's not a password, and we know it's not a symmetric key. And so they the answer has to be the initialization vector. Question 57, how does chain block ciphering create randomness in the next block of data? So chain block ciphering uses the results of the initialization vector to encrypt the next block of data. That's the answer. The second option here increments the initialization vector to encrypt the next block. Well, it's saying increments, so you know that's the counter mode where it just keeps counting up. How does chain block ciphering create randomness in the next block of data? So with the first block of data, this is the data, it goes through this initialization vector, then it's encrypted, creating this cipher one text. And this cipher one text, uh, the way it creates randomness in the next block of data is it takes this cipher one and then it uses this as the initialization vector for block two. So block two is then um, zored with cipher one and then it's put through this encryption to cipher two. And then cipher two is then used for the next block of data into for block three and zored against that. And so specifically, like here's the block of data, and then here's the initialization vector, and then it, this is the result of the ZOR, which then gets encrypted, creating the cipher two. And that process goes on forever. Question 58, how is information about Bitcoin stored? First, I wanna take a look at all the options on here. A command and control center, that is a centralized um, infra infrastructure or area or computer system that is controlling all the other devices in a malicious way. So a bad, bad actor has their command and control center where they're controlling all their bots. The platform as a service and infrastructure as a service, those are for the cloud. Um, the infrastructure that's referring to you're renting hardware from the cloud service provider and the platform as a service, you're renting the hardware in addition to all the um, infrastructure hardware devices are interconnected to each other and you're able to just build directly your application or software in their cloud environment. So Bitcoin is stored in the distributed peer-to-peer -peer network. I want to talk a little bit about what the distributed peer-to-peer -peer network means and that's a network architecture where multiple nodes or devices are connected to each other without a centralized um, server. I also want you guys to understand that all of these transactions are stored in a public ledger, specifically for Bitcoin, and that's a record of transactions or data that is publicly accessible and maintained by multiple parties um, in a decentralized man man manner, which is also known as blockchain. And so the public ledger allows um, anybody to be able to go and look up those transactions because it's public. 
So important information on blockchain, we're going to cover that here for question 59. So it's focused on protecting against someone spending money they don't have access to uh, by storing it in a public ledger or blockchain. It's very computationally expensive to mine um, and the rewards for mining are diminished over time. A transfer is considered when a transfer from one account ID goes to another account ID and it's confirmed by the miners which process all the transactions within a 10 minute period. When the transaction is recorded, it creates a new hash for the block and contains the previous hash. And it's, so it's building that transaction, transaction log. And the one main thing that's important to also very much know is that the owner of the, the Bitcoin has a private key and they're using it to sign the transaction, proving ownership. And so if they're going to sell it, they're going to provide their private key to... Uh, or whoever they're transferring it to, to that the other party, and then they're going to be able to verify it is the person that they say they are, and that's how these uh, transactions are completed. Question 60. What is the length of the private key used to sign a transaction in Bitcoin? Well, the length is 256, and if you're interested, it specifically uses this elliptic curve digital uh, signature algorithm. 